Okay, uh, our final uh, keynote of uh, this morning is uh, Kate Stewart. Uh, Kate is the uh, Vice President of Dependable uh, Embedded Systems at the Linux Foundation. Today, uh, Kate will discuss uh, building dependence, uh, dependable systems with open source. Please welcome Kate Stewart. You guys are getting me? Okay, great. My name is Kate Stewart, and I have been focusing for the last couple of years here at the Linux Foundation all about what we need to do to help embedded open source systems become dependable. In system engineering terms, dependability is a measure of a system's availability, reliability, maintainability, safety, and security. And so let's consider um, a product we want to be dependable, a car. Since Dad's just been talking to us about it, this is a nice little segue. Um, more of the components are built in this car on open source every year, you know, such as the AD AGL's device entertainment system. Ooh. Sorry about the noise. Um, today's car is likely to also have cameras embedded into it for the driver to see back views with side views. There's also radar sensors to measure the distance and to provide alerts when you're getting too close to something. And through a lot of slides. But anyhow, back to this, this. So there's radar sensors to measure the distance and to provide alerts when you get too close to something, another object. So this helps keep drivers and passengers safe. This is a good thing. In addition, there's also proximity information coming in now. So you'll see dashboards that are incorporating the navigational assistance to help the driver get to a destination, you know, using GPS technologies and communicating with external services to understand such things as traffic conditions. We're all using this today, either on a phone or in the car. And all of this information is, you know, helping to keep the drivers and passengers safe and arrive at the destination sooner. But, you know, as we're moving more towards the autonomous stuff, LIDAR and other sensors are now being incorporated. And we need to filter this information and react appropriately to what's being detected if you don't have a human evaluating it. So this is going to be the challenge. So trained AI models are being connected to these sensors. They are doing some filtering. They are working it through for this. And the data sets being used to train these models are now important. And so the input from all these multiple sensors needs to be coordinated. And we need to basically take it beyond what we've been using to date. So modern products are clearly now more than just hardware and software. Cars went from being hardware and software to be so just being hardware, you know, from 1910 up to 1970s, 80s, and now they've came to hardware and software, and now they're evolving to incorporate AI, models trained on data sets, and working and expecting external services to work. So from that safe driving car example, we now have more ingredients that we have to consider in our analysis. And so we have hardware, software, training data sets, and communication to remote services. So we need to leverage system engineering the whole discipline of system engineering was created for solving complex systems interacting. And we need to pull all the factors into our analysis now. So um, I just, there's an AI artificial, AI incident database that's public. Anyone can go look at it. And what it does is it tracks any social media references to um, incidents with AI. So I looked at what was happening for the cars for last year. These are all from this year. And so we have various um, incidents, case numbers. And if we go and start drilling down on one of them, it was an article in the Washington Post, and there was pulling other more data together, too. And so when you start looking at it, you see things like, um, you know, it contains, con um, there's concerns that, quite frankly, the AI didn't recognize a school bus stop sign. It's not been trained to handle interactions with motorcycles and emergency vehicles. Over 800,000 cars in the US today have the autopilot capability. 
and almost half of them had to be recalled to fix the fact that it wasn't recognizing traffic lights, stop signs, and speed limits by the autopilot. And so, like last year, the self-driving um, car capability was you know, fully enabled from 12,000 to over 400,000 of these cars. And then la in this last year as well, we've been living through this experiment that two-thirds of all instrument, uh, of all the reported incidents to the National Highway Transport Administration in the US were because of test were tes from Tesla. So all the other car makers have a less aggressive rollout of the technologies and are only a fraction by comparison. But we are living with this and we need it to be changed and be safe. So what we need to look at is, you know, that's just what's happening with the AI. What happens when, oh, we need to save some money here, we've got to remove a sensor. Well, actually, this actually happened in some of these cases and they said um, they had to reintroduce some radar sensors. And so there's cars out there without some of this and there's cars with it. So we've got a lot of factors that are gonna be coming into play that we're gonna to need to analyze to understand if we are working with something that's safe or trying to make it as safe as we possibly can. And certainly when I read these sorts of things, living in the US and living near a Tesla dealership, it worries me. <laughs> so, um, you know, as you can see, there's more ways things can go wrong right now. And so what we need to figure out is, you know, um, how can we get all that information together and expand from a software bomb to a true system bill of materials? We've had hardware bombs for forever, okay? We've been adding software bombs in recently because of security. We really need to get more inputs of our more of ingredients incorporated to get so that we can do these safety analysis properly. So to do this, we're gonna be needing the standardized metadata from all of the supply chains. We need it coming from the hardware, the software, the data sets, there's a whole slew of data provenance, and we need it from the services. And we need to pull this together and be able to get it so the way that we can connect it and make reasoned choices about it. And to do that, it also needs to be accurate. And the one thing we've been learning over this last year with the S-bombs is you capture the data when it's created in the product's life cycle, and that'll give you the most precision, okay? When you're actually looking at your sources or you're looking at your design, there's information there that the engineers know, and that should be surfaced up. And then we, what we need to do is connect the design to the code, to the build image, and so forth, and create knowledge graphs. And this isn't just for cars. We're gonna want this for our whole entire critical infrastructure. We need to get to this level of analysis so we can do safety properly. And so we're gonna be needing to look at how we can get this metadata to work in the ecosystem. Today, when I talk to people who've been working on this, it tends to be collections of uh, papers, files, reports, it tends to be spreadsheets, it tends to be manual processes, this doesn't scale to where we need to go. It just flat out doesn't scale, okay? When we're talking about changes like one big bug fix an hour into the Linux kernel, manual processes don't scale. And we wanna make sure that things, if there's a security issue, we've dealt with it, and things stay safe. So what we've been looking at about for about two years now is evolving SPDX into profiles so that we can provide a framework for connecting this metadata. And so it's about components, the processes, the requirements, the evidence to support product line management at scale. And so that's what's been missing. So SPDX, is the 2.2 is an ISO standard, and it export, supports exchanging the metadata between the systems today. So the software bill of materials, it's got everything you need for software bill of materials today. And it also supports traceability between requirements, code, test, and evidence. That's there today. However, what we're doing with 3.0 is we're transforming it into being able to be effective in a database so that we can actually pull all these elements in as they emerge over time and be able to understand the current state at a point in time. That's what databases are for. And so we're also bringing in profiles to capture domain-specific information and extend beyond what we've got today towards the AI and the models, as well as the data set provenance because, okay, has this data set been trained with stop signs or not is kind of important, um, you know, for kids coming out of buses. Um, the other thing is, you know, can we extend um, to support the product life cycles? The information you have when you're building is different than the information you're gonna get when things are running in the field or you've deployed it in a test environment. All of these things need to come together. So we're looking at three, and then we're already working 
in the SPDX community. We've got working groups active today working on starting to articulate hardware. So we need to tie the software to the hardware, to those specific chips, as Dan was saying, and put these pieces together, and then also, quite frankly, deal with virtual hardware and virtualized environments, like digital twins are going to be needed here, especially when you don't have easy access to work with things. So the services also are going to be coming in and are being used today. We need to be able to represent them and tie those into the reasoning so that you know when there's dependencies, you can actually check them. And all this is being combined in the safety profile. So SPDX3, um, the 3.0 model repository has all the profiles for three in it today now. And we are prototyping the serializations. We've got um, sample JSON emitting serializations working and Python libraries and so forth. And so anyone who wants to go kick the tires, we would welcome input right now. And right now, with, if you use the core, the software, the licensing, and the light profiles, you have effectively all the functionality we have it today in 2.3. However, on top of that, you'll see, oops, well, we're adding in security, build, AI, and data. And that is what is going to start to let us get, expand out beyond just the software space into the system space. So we can start to reason about what we've got and what the real dependencies are. And we're starting to make sure that we can support and say, where has this information come from in the life cycle? Okay? Because that information gives you an element of, did someone try to reason about it from a third party tool or did the people who were working on it generate it and check it off and attest that it's valid? And this brings in some of the things we're doing in OpenSSF that are going to be playing into this as well. And we've basically worked on very hard to align with the SBOM types coming out of the CISA working groups and efforts and publications. So we're lining up with that and we're lining up to take and make sure all the relationships in 2.3 are supported and also adding in the concept of um, some of the prototype work that we're going on and expanding the, um, them to contain lifecycle information as well as one to many so we can be more concise when we're expressing things. So SPDX is very much focused on component modularity. And so putting relationships between components allows us to create that knowledge graph that we're going to need. So we're going to need it for doing that efficient and accurate safety and security analysis. And so we can take the safety artifacts right now and map them into these SBOM types and say, OK, these, put these things here. This is the type of thing it'll belong with, so forth. So we're prototyping this stuff right now as paper exercises. And we're starting to see some tooling emerge. And with this type of model, I'm working with safety people, we can represent a V model type of analysis today with all the artifacts for a safety plan. And then you can connect it up to the code and you can connect it up to the tests and you can connect it up to the evidence. So you can take your design SBOMs, you can go to your sources, and you can basically then take and take the SSRSS bombs and you can say it generates a certain set of executable images. Um, the paper tree isn't working here. Okay. And then what happens though when you start to see a dependency? Well, all of a sudden now you have a way of reasoning about this so that you say, oh, there's a problem with this executable image. Okay. Did it come from my supply chain? That was the build supply chain. Was there a problem in that way? Or was it coming in from something? Was it something that was generated from the source code? And in some of these cases we've been talking about, has this come from training data too, will be now a function, an issue that we might be having up here. And if it's coming from the source code, was it an issue with our coding guidelines? Or was it an issue with the requirement for the code? The reason why types of deal. And then, you know, as you sort of work your way back, well, potentially, is there some problems with the requirements in the code in order to do the analysis? These sorts of ability to reason about this stuff at the higher component level, as well as, as part of the full system is what's going to be needed to automate this all and to get away from the paper processes, okay? And quite frankly, get rid of the false positives, but anyhow, on the security side. So component level, we can do component level traceability today with SPX23. All of those relationships exist, working, you can use it with, as is and play with a route like that. But one of the things that's gonna be really great for getting rid of false positives is you can go inside the components and say, hey, this file actually made it into my image. So if there's a bug in this component, which files are actually affected? Is it actually in my image or not? Was it built into that image? You can be saying that. And we're doing that today in the Zephyr project. Come talk to me afterwards and I'll show you. Um, but 
If we can do that, then we know, okay, these tests have to be run to satisfy the requirement. That generates evidence and it says the requirement's satisfied. So when a bug fix happens, what happens then is you can figure out, you know, um, for these requirements, I need to rerun these tests. Oh, I might need to generate a new requirement here and add a new test. And then that gets part of this big database we're keeping on behalf of a product line so that you can stay compliant. Okay, so we need to start thinking beyond where we are right now to how do we do this properly and make it efficient for everyone. The other side that's going to come here is, well, okay, I'm using this foo.c, I made a fix there. How do I change, you know, which requirements actually we're using that source file? We can make that traceability happen. And we basically can then say, okay, these other tests, I want to check to make sure I haven't caused a regression. These are the pieces that will let us have trust that we are done after we applied a security fix. We have it very much crisp and clear exactly what has to be rerun. So, you know, how do we establish requirements for open source code? and you know, that the system engineering and safety analysis need. Well, all of these pieces of code were put in with whys. Um, there's a reason why each piece of code was accepted. And that's part of it. Um, there's also man pages that say what it should be doing. These are all things that are there. So there's uh, four projects I work with that are starting to look at trying to figure out how we can figure our way through this and effectively surface up the requirements that are in a place. Everyone has sort of cultural knowledge of what is happening on certain things, but it is not written down in a way that you can connect requirements for a system yet. So how do we get there? Um, first, I'm just going to say Yocto. Um, Yocto, basically, we're using, it's, you know, how to, it's not embedded in Linux distribution. It creates one for you. So it creates your tool chain. And when it does that, it generates an SBOM of it. And then when that S tool chain runs to build the rest of the pieces, it creates S-bombs for those pieces. And so today um, in Yocto, reproducible binaries are supported, which is one of the key things we're going to need here. And Yocto generates the SPD S-bombs by turning on an option. That's all you need to do. You have, you'll get a lot of S-bomb data showing up out of this if you actually just turn the option on. And so the system view is done right now. That system level view I said we need to go to is um, through UUIDs today. That's uh, through a master index. And then we're participating in creation. They, so they've come in and they wanted to get that system level right. So they've been working with our community on the build level profile. And there's product line bomb generation working with SPDX that they're prototyping. And they're doing more work on linking their tests in with the components. So, you know, the nice thing about working with Yocto is any feature we work with in Yocto scales throughout the entire ecosystem. Elisa is looking at, um, for Linux, how do we start working around this tremendously changing code base, what are the requirements? How do we start to get our heads around this elephant? And so there's been groups of people working in various use for the last couple of years. And one of the groups that just formed last year is a systems group, which is putting these things, systems together as concepts and looking at the analysis of Linux as part of a system. And so one of the things we're doing is working with some of the folks at AGL and we're basically looking at integrating this stuff all together into a reference system that anyone can take and download and swap pieces in and out of so that we can then start reasoning about it. And you'll see that we're using uh, the Zen project, we're using Linux, and we're using Zephyr, and we're gonna be putting a simple application on top of it all. So we have the safety constraints. And we'll use that to do the reasoning. And I would like to be um, announce a brand new open source tool just became available for requirements tracing. It's called Basil. And Red Hat has contributed this to the Elisa project. And what it does is it lets you trace requirements and to code, to test, and do it in an open fashion so that people can review it and peer review it. So we can start to finally break apart and build a community where people are caring about the pieces they care about most and putting the requirements that they care about and crowdsourcing things together. We've been missing this. Every industry, every people in the industry have been doing it for themselves when they're using Linux, and we have no, had no way to share. So we've created a way so we can share this effort. And the Zephyr project is participating here. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Zephyr is an RTOS. Um, and we started off with safety and security for resource-constrained devices in mind at the very start. And we have our initial certification focus. We're working with uh, TubeSud on um, getting for 61508 right now. 
And we are also using Zephyr to prototype requirements traceability. We're using StrictDoc in this project, which is another open source tool. Um, and we're basically working on putting together the hierarchy of requirements and matching it to the code. So we're doing that exercise in Zephyr, which is a much smaller footprint than the Linux kernel, to see how it's going to work and see if it will work well for the developers and the maintainers in that project. And then in the Zen project, um, Zen is also focusing on safety and security because it's a hypervisor. Mm -hmm. So what it's trying to do is see, it has a working group that is focusing on safety as we're going along. So Zen support today is basically looking at, you know, safety critical. Um, it's people use it for safety critical system today. But they're working at the maintainer level of improving the coding style with MISR-C. They're adopting things one by one. And they're basically looking at features to improve the real time and reduce interference. <laughs> so they're looking at the piece, that fundamental piece that everyone's going to be needing. And they're working on it right now. And the project members are looking, and there's project members actually looking at getting 61508 and 262 certification. So they have a functional safety working group that I participate in and others are welcome to join. So if you want to continue the discussion, there'll be a BOF tomorrow afternoon. Um, if, and I've got links in the slides to the Elisa working group on the system side. Come join us there. Talk about Zephyr, um, Zen, or Yocto. Happy to talk about all of those tomorrow in the BOF. Or please, if you know of other projects, open source projects, that are working towards safety, come talk to us and see if we can help bring you all, you know, bring this all together and build upon each other's work. Um, and then, as you've seen, we've got a framework now for connecting this all together at the requirement level that was missing before. So we can start to compose systems from the requirements and do the system engineering properly. And join us on the SPDX side if you want to start talking about that and integrating things. So I guess I'm going to leave you with the, um, everything sort of old is new again. <laughs> but, um, you know, system engineering practices need to be to apply to today's systems. And they, have, and they are probably being applied within companies very diligently but we're not doing it out in the open, and so we're wasting a lot of time and a lot of work and getting everyone frustrated. And so manual isn't going to suffice for the scale of change in open source as well as features and functionality. And so, you know, we've got to integrate open source efficiently into software engineering. It's overdue. And we're going to need a community to participate here. So, and I'm just going to leave you with a hint is, don't expect the upstream project maintainers to take the lead here. We've got to find new people to basically do it. And if we're lucky, they'll tell us we're wrong. Thank you. <laughs>